let's uh, begin our time with prayer, shall we? Our Lord and our God, we come to you today uh, anxious for your spirit to be working in our midst. And so we ask you for that. We ask that the conversation that has begun today will uh, be something that you use in the life of the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Australia to see it uh, thrive and grow and expand and be useful in your kingdom, Lord, to see people one to Christ and disciple to completion. And so bring us, uh, Lord, today to a a measure of seriousness about this, that we would uh, look carefully at our own lives and the lives of the, of the church and see that we can uh, contribute in what we can do, Lord, to see your kingdom come and your will done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for your help now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This is, uh, I want to give a couple of disclaimers here at the beginning. This is not a typical sermon. So, uh, you're getting more of a, a consultant coming and teaching and, and discussing with you and that kind of thing. So this is not just a preaching passage. Tomorrow will be uh, obviously a service of worship, so that will be a preaching setting. But uh, my time here this weekend is basically addressing a pretty significant question and hopefully something that has been uh, on your mind and hearts as well as mine. Um, we've been, uh, well, I have to say it this way. Um, I know that some of you are not from the Reformed Presbyterian Church. Maybe you're visiting and you're here. At, we're glad to have you. Uh, we are going to be talking fairly specifically about our denomination here in Australia. Um, I was asked to come, in a sense, to Australia to be a consultant as well as a pastor in the Frankston congregation to help us look at the question of desiring growth in the kingdom and how we can see expansion happen in the church and so on. So that's partly what I'm doing today is bringing a report. Um, somewhat pointed then in the Reformed Presbyterian direction, but I hope it's helpful as we look at principles and things like that in general as well. Uh, I really want this to be something that, I mean, maybe you can imagine this, I've probably spent over a month preparing the materials for this. Uh, imagine people coming and hearing a message, maybe two, three messages, and then uh, all of them saying, that was really good, I like that, thank you, that was I appreciate that. And then you go home and nothing really changes. That's a potential thing to happen today, and I want to see if we can, by God's grace, not let that happen. Because really, what we're doing today is asking the question, why is the Reformed Presbyterian Church not growing in a greater rate? <laughs> why are we not seeing the kind of fruit that we would love to see? Uh, there's things like that. So my first talk this morning is, why have we not seen more growth? As I talk about that, it's a little bit hard to do that because uh, I'm going to say some things which I think we um, will, I hope, be provocative in our thinking, uh, but I also want to do it gently and carefully because I love you, I love the church, I want to see the church thrive and, and be helpful, and I certainly am no uh, you know, prince on a white horse coming you with grand ideas that you've never heard or things like that. So I, I hope to be one who stimulates thought and we can go from there. And I really am coming, in a sense, on a mission from uh, at this fellowship camp from the Presbytery. The Presbytery has put together a strategy committee that has been working now for a little bit over three years. And over that time, we came up with a, a, a document, which is I have with me here. It's just three pages long, and it's a, the, the idea of it is to communicate um, what are the, the things that the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Australia might think about in terms of growth and development in ways that we have not uh, areas where we could improve, where we might see those things. And so um, that committee has commissioned me with, uh, with helping the denomination to grow and expand its witness here in Australia. Uh, our desire is to expand from three congregations into spreading out throughout Victoria and then eventually beyond that. So I'm here to share the conclusions of that committee. That's part of what I'm, what I'm doing. And this is the largest audience of the, the whole denomination we can kind of get together, so we're excited about that possibility. Um, what, if anything, needs to change? And I have to say that if we don't change anything, we shouldn't expect any difference in, in the way things are going, right? So we have to expect to say we had to start a process here today that will go back to each congregation where there's discussions that bring about change in, in each situation. And I hope there's change in your own heart as well. Your own sense of conviction, your own uh, ownership of the ministry of the Reformed Presbyterian Church. That's what I'm hoping for. 
Now, anything I say to you in terms of principles for growth uh, for the church needs to be understood that those are true only as I state them if you mix in common sense. <laughs> okay? You have to have common sense as you think about these things. So when I make a statement that says something like the church should be growing, not only in spiritual depth of uh, its membership, but really in numbers, we should be growing in numbers, you have to understand that that's not an either or arrangement. Right? We are desirous to grow spiritually. That's why we're here to camp. We gather for fellowship and we experience the means of grace and we really grow together. But the idea is that we will then be equipped to go minister. Right? Some would argue that the church shouldn't be concerned about numbers. Have you heard that? I don't know. Have you heard that? That we really need, need to be faithful. And as long as we're faithful, we don't need to worry about numbers. Well, I think we need to stop when we hear that argument and realize that's a false dichotomy. Why are you putting those two things in odds with one another? Could we not say that when Jesus came to make us fishers of men, and I think, hello, hello, yeah. When he came to make us fishers of men, that he expect his disciples to see people, fish, come into the nets? Um, yeah. Who would expect that faithfulness would you know, involve fish catching? Well, the appropriateness of a title of being fishers of men uh, to a church members who are faithful to be about the work of, you know, fixing their bait and sharpening their cleaning knives and occasionally throwing the line in the water, but really who never catch fish, that could be questioned to be called fishers of men, right? So as I begin what's hopefully an honest analysis, uh, even if a, a bit oversimplified, you have to be simplified if you're going to give it this quickly, right? You have to understand that I, I, I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I absolutely love the church here in Australia. I come from America. That's where I was grown, grown up and, and where I came from. But uh, one of the reasons I'm honestly in Australia is because God put it in my heart years ago that we would see success in the ministry of the church. Now, my parents came over to Australia when I was 16 years old. I was here for three years, and then I returned to the States and have been over there for over 30 years since. But during those three years, I met people in the church in Australia who I grew to love and I thought these people are servants of Jesus Christ in the kingdom work uh, in a faraway place from where I live and I was excited to see God doing a work particularly in a relationship to a denomination of which I'm a part now I know that he works through all churches he, he, he works through faithful churches who are in the word of God uh, but this is my denomination this is the one I grew up in and this is the one I think is faithful as I know it to, to serve Christ the way he would have us do that so I was one who grew to love the church here. So in my childhood, the Lord's been working in me a deep desire to see this church grow and thrive in service. And it's for that reason that I've had a problem that has arisen in my mind and my heart, and that is to say that when I was here, which was back in 1981, a lot of years have gone by since then. And actually, there were four congregations when I was here, uh, back in 1981, and now there are three. And I ask the question, how can that be? What is the Lord Jesus doing with the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Australia? You know, that's a tough question. And it's for that reason I begin to ask questions. I'm trying to uh, point, uh, I'm not trying to point the finger of blame to any of us individually or anything like that because I'm not in a position to do that. I really don't know uh, all the ins and outs of the whys. I'm certainly asking questions. Um, but I'm looking at a big picture because that's something I want to do and help you do together. And I want to ask the question, could we receive more of God's blessing? You know, if we were to, to understand where we've been falling short, if we've been able to understand where we have been walking and not walking maybe as Christ would have us walk as a church, could we receive God's blessing in a greater way of growth and expansion in the church uh, if we did that? So as a denomination, I would like us to ask that. And I think it'd be good for the RPCNA, RPCA to, to take a look at the numbers. As fishers of men, what have our nets brought in? Okay? If you take a historic timeline, um, again, the Reformed Presbyterian Church pastor, the first one, came here in, I think it was in the 1850s. Um, the first worship service that they were able to gather together had 12 people who came. Okay? So that's pretty understandable at, at that stage of the development. And five years later, it took uh, before a congregation was actually established. And of course, that's the congregation in Geelong, which you're many, so many of you are, are a part of. 
now we are in two, uh, 2024. And that's 166 years later. We've had 21 different pastors who've served uh, in the denomination during that time. And we have three congregations. So uh, 166 years and we've grown to three. Um, unfortunately, those three are not in health, conditions of health. Full health, I should say. Um, and really, as a denomination, we've grown from 12 people who first started to worship together uh, to now 162 communicant members, give or take. I'm, I, that's the latest figures I was able to get off the minutes of, of things. But, and those are just the adult communicant members, of course. But in the last 15 years, the largest number of communicant members in the congregation of which I'm a part has been 31. Okay, 31 is the largest communicant membership that Frankston has had uh, for a number of years. Um, in, let's see. And it has decreased since the date when it was at, uh, at that number. In McKinnon, that number is at a current uh, number of 32, I believe. Current 32 communicant members. Uh, that's probably on an increasing scale, but I'm quite glad to see that. And I give those stark numbers to you to help us uh, be confronted with the question, what is going on? <laughs> you know, uh, does something need to change? And that needs to be an authentic uh, question, not something that is imposed on you. I want you to develop this question in your own hearts. Um, yeah, as we, think about, as we think about all these things, there are several passages in the scripture that kind of come to my mind as we wrestle with this, and they have to do with the bearing of fruit. I think if I was to poll you uh, today and ask you what, you've, what are some passages that talk about bearing fruit, one of them for sure would be John 15, 5 that comes up, right? Uh, John 15, 5. Why is this not kicking in today? Yeah, there it is. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Now, I, uh, I'm not crazy. I understand that fruit can be born in all kinds of ways. It's not just numbers. Fruit in the heart of individuals. And I think that's perhaps where the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Australia has thrived. There is a real sense of fruit in the hearts of individuals. Uh, but there's another passage I want to turn to with you today, and that's Haggai chapter 1. Uh, so if you have a Bible, you can look, at the, look there with me. But Haggai chapter 1 in that passage, of course, is what you find the Israelites are coming back from exile. Uh, they have been given a, a commission to rebuild the city, to rebuild the temple, to get right back to work again. Uh, Cyrus the Great is the one who is uh, sending them off on this decree to return to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple. Uh, and I would say that in a sense that's sort of a rebuilding of the church, right? Uh, a restructuring, getting things reestablished in the ministry uh, back in Jerusalem. Um, and that was roughly around 550 BC when that commission was given by Cyrus. Uh, they got back and actually 30 years later King Darius uh, was the, the king at the time. And they haven't made much progress. 30 some years later. They didn't see the results that they expected. And here's what the Bible describes as the problem. So I found Haggai chapter 1 to perhaps be a helpful passage for us to look at. So let me read Haggai chapter 1 for you. I'm going to read just the first 15 verses, if I may. Okay, you can follow along on, on here if you'd like to, or in your Bible. In the second year of King Darius, uh, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. And then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Have you sown much? Or you have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but nobody's warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
consider your ways. Go up to the hills. I'm not sure where I am on that. Probably time to flip that. I don't know. Anyway, consider your... Uh, your, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house that lies in ruins while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew and the earth has withheld its produce. And I've called for a drought on the land and on the hills and on the grain and the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and on all their labors. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, skipping about that, sorry about that, uh, son of Shealtiel, the son of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. And then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. When the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king blessing comes down and, and uh, helps them in their work. So I, as we look at the question uh, that we're wrestling with, the problem in this situation was clearly that the work of God's people uh, was as they were trying to rebuild the temple particularly, in a, in a very metaphoric way, I think there's a sense in which he, they were trying to build God's house play on words there, but uh, it was not being successful. They were trying to build God's house, not being successful, but why? Because he states, the people are not obeying the fundamental principle of every single believer. Every believer in God. And I would suggest to you that that's a principle underlined again and again in both Old and New Testaments. Yeah, here's the, here's the principle. Namely, that believers must make eternal things what serves Christ's purposes, their priority. Matthew chapter 6.33 is maybe the clearest statement of it that you'll find in Scripture, but it's, it's simply there in this parallel uh, that I would like to show you because in Haggai, and it's on your handout so you see it as well, um, in Haggai these eternal things are, are referred to in a sense as his building the house, building the house. Uh, Old Testament says, Go up to the hills and bring wood in and build my house that I may take pleasure in it. You've been looking for much, but you found it came to little. When you, you do these labors, you know, you bring it home, but I blow it away. Why, God's saying, and it's because uh, the house of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you is busy about your houses. Okay, that's the, that's the Haggai passage. In New Testament, we have the passage, what, you know, don't be anxious about the things that you're eating or you're drinking or what shall we wear. Because the Gentiles all seek after those things. Your Heavenly Father knows you need those things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I'm suggesting to you that that's the principle that all believers are to follow. You certainly see it in Scripture, right? It's found elsewhere. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 drives home this passage as well. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above told in Matthew to seek first the kingdom. Here it says, seek the things that are above where Christ is. He's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things on the earth. I find that passage, this, that principle, all the way through Scripture. Now even the efforts that the people are making in, in rebuilding their society in Jerusalem were not being blessed of God. They looked for much, and behold, it kept coming to little. And the question is asked, why? And the answer is because they are allowing God's house to lie in ruins. What does that mean, practically? It means that they're, they're thinking to themselves, I can't get to that work because I'm dealing with my own life. I have a lot of stuff going on in my own life right now. I need to rebuild my own house. My farm, which is our means of sustenance, is, is still got rubble in it. 
You know, when the when the enemies came in, the Babylonians and other, they destroyed the land. And so, uh, so much needs to be repaired. For if I can get my house together, then then we'll have time to get to to God's stuff. You see that that principle. And they think about the the. Per- practicalities of returning from exile into a destroyed situation. You have a situation in which there's some anxiety about your food. Where's my food going to come from? What am I going to wear? Because all of the industries of, of things are, are kind of broken down, right? Uh, what, what am I going to have shelter for my family? I'm anxious about all those things. <laughs> and if I can if, move us to the New Testament passage... What is Jesus saying? Don't be anxious about those things. Seek first the kingdom. Your Father knows you need those things. And I will bless you with all the others. So here's, that's the principle I want us to begin to track through the Scripture here and, and, and see what are the implications for us. Uh, the Strategy Committee, which has been working on thinking through this in our particular context, believes that at least in part we ought to be asking if this might be true. Not an accusation, it's asking the question. In what ways might we be guilty of that same kind of thing where we have prioritized our own life situations and we haven't said, Lord, I'm going to seek your kingdom first. I'm going to be sacrificial in my view of of how we can build your kingdom knowing that you know I have needs and, and I have to feed my family and I have to care for these things. So Lord, I'll trust you for those things as well. Over many years, we have labored to see the church grow and expand in Australia. Uh, And many people have given sacrificially. Many people have served. Many of you have done that. You have given much. Uh, And unfortunately, we have looked for much together, I think. And behold, it has come, in some ways, to little. Not nothing, to be sure. God has maintained the ministry here in Australia. and There has been much ministry to individuals. We can give testimonies, a lot of us, to how God used each other and how he's used messengers, uh, people who've brought the message of God and and has ministered to us and we've ministered to one another. So it's nothing. It's not nothing. But I think after 166 years, we might say, it's not come to what we would expect. And when that's true in Judah, what does God say to him by his prophet? He says, consider your ways. Think about it. Ask some questions about this and, and think about how you're seeking first the kingdom. Are you doing that? Well, as we began that process as a committee, uh, we would like very much to invite the rest of the denomination as a whole. We're not we're not huge, so we can do this. We're small enough that we can say, let's talk about it together, all of us, and ask them questions and say, how can we begin to to, uh, wrestle with this question? We have three congregations. And to help us, the, the committee has come up with seven areas that we think it would be helpful to communicate to you to, to see if we can wrestle with these seven areas, to see if these are areas we might improve, or these uh, we might try to address to see God's blessing again in a new way, in a fuller way, with growth and expansion. I'm going to summarize them for you here. I'm not going to go at length into all of them. Uh, and then tomorrow in the service, uh, I'm going to address maybe two of them in a much more full way, and then on Monday I'm really going to get to uh, what a focus I think I'd like to have for the whole thing. Well, let me summarize them for you here a little bit. Seven areas that we uh, would like to see improvement in, if you could. And honestly, I want to say that the first one requires a great humility on our part. It's never easy to have somebody evaluate us and say, here's where you have fallen short. And I don't really feel comfortable even saying that, but I I think as a committee we're saying these are areas that we could really do better. (laughs) Uh, so the first one requires a humility that, that um, says, kind of in the spirit of the people who've heard the prophet Haggai come, how is that true of, of us and how might I repent of that? So the idea is, uh, the first one, personal and corporate repentance. I'm anxious to hear your discussions about this because it's, it's one thing to sort of have a personal conviction and say, I could do better, and Lord, help me change. And, and repentance is that, right? It's change. It's, it's not just, oh, I'm sorry. It's, I'm going to change. So as we think together as a denomination how we can approach things, personally it has to begin in our own hearts where we say, there's something about my own area where I need to change some things. 
Uh, that I think were easier to understand, but how do we do so corporately? You know, how do we as a church together say, uh, Lord, we want to start off in a new direction? And I want to say historically, that's what the Reformed Presbyterian Church, known as the Covenanters, were about. Covenanting together and saying, Lord, help us start on a new path. Help us go in a new direction. So that's something that's in our nature, I think, in some way. So we'll talk about that more in the discussion groups about how does that work? How, does that, uh, how do you work those things out? Another area that I like to have us do is maybe that first one, that area of repentance, uh, this gives us some focus on how we can begin to turn those things around. And the next one is prayer. Prayer is a display of our trust. Yeah. Prayer is a display of our trust and dependency. Um, <coughs> nobody here would argue that prayer is a big part of being a Christian, right? That that's something that it would be about. Um, I'd like to have us think about this particularly, I think the committee would like to have us think about prayer in terms of how are we looking at the big picture of, of God's advancement of his kingdom in Australia? And how is our prayer so geared toward that? Uh, it's it's d displaying to God every time we pray corporately, maybe it's in a worship service or uh, in our own homes as a families or in small groups together in the congregation. Or are we praying and saying, God, if you don't bless the Reformed Presbyterian Church in Australia, we're wasting our time. Just wasting our time. Okay? Um, prayer meetings. We often think about prayer meetings. Yeah, they're good things. We should be about that. And I think what we're saying is we have a new sense that prayer is the work of the church. That's where the church gets things accomplished. Is where we say, God, have mercy on us. Use us as your tool. We desire to be used. Would you please do that? Would you have mercy and use us? We want to see that happen. So that's what we want to see as a new emphasis in that kind of direction. The third one is really along this line of taking that, that main principle as Christians and owning it. It's a kingdom conviction and, and commitment to say, I, I see the need to seek first the kingdom in a new way. And this is an area we see, and I'll be honest, right, this is what we're trying to be here is honest, we can always kind of look around us and say, well, that person seems to be doing that. <laughs> and I wonder about that person, you know. I don't see them having that kind of commitment. Starts in here. Doesn't start out there looking at everybody else. It starts here and saying, what about my own life? Have I sought the kingdom of Christ first and foremost above everything else that I do? Yes, I have to have a job. Yes, I have to do other pursuits and things. But how is my job serving Christ? Because that's what it's for. <laughs> How am I making a living and supporting my family so that we can serve Christ? That's, that's the deal. And again, we can, we can see and ask the question, how much am I doing that? And then we want to together work on that. Okay, the fourth one is in the area of discipleship particularly. How are, how are we as a church in Australia, the Reformed Presbyterian Church here, how are we taking someone who's new to the faith who comes into the church and how are we helping them grow to the point of completion? We're going to talk about that in full on Monday. That's really one of the ways I think we can make a huge change in Australia and actually see God's blessing of growth in a way. I'm, I'm hoping that discipleship is one of the key areas there. We want to bring people to maturity, so that's the goal. Fifth, developing skilled servant leaders within the church. Uh, you know that we often struggle to find leadership in the church. Uh, and, and that's true for males and females. We're, we're, we always have be need for leadership there in various different kinds of ways. Uh, we need s develop skilled servant leaders. And then next, sharing the gospel by, uh, obviously evangelism is a part of the Christian work, but how are we doing that? And I think the area that the, the social or strategy committee felt we could do better was in really how we develop relationships with unbelievers. So developing and establishing loving relationships with those who are outside the faith. There's always a, a wrestling point for a church to keep themselves pure from the world, to enjoy the beauties of the, the means of grace of Christian fellowship. So to do those things at the same time being those who are making disciples of all the nations, <laughs> which is outside of our church. <coughs> protect the circle, protect ourselves, and so we have these wonderful, rich Christian fellowships which bolster us up in our, in our walk with Christ. 
uh, but be careful that they're not influencing us. And so we kind of have a, a protected wall there. In a sense, the mission of the church is to go into the, all the world. Go and have that protection in your heart and, and, and so on, but that you're ministering to those in the world and you're, you're reaching those in the world. And, and so that's going to have to be a change if we're going to do that in a way that's going to reach uh, more and see God's blessing. The last one I want to talk about is just uh, knowing how to engraft new people. When people do come to our churches, uh, we want to see them feel like that's their home, that this is a place we, we recognize this is my church home. I, I've grown into the, the midst of that. And we've got people from all kinds of backgrounds that are coming uh, into that context. And, and often they find, I don't feel like I can get in the door. I don't know how I can be a part of this because they have such a history. They have such connections with one another and I don't have any of that. How can I be a part of that? You know, And, and so we as a denomination want to work really hard at how we assimilate new people into the body life. Now, we really enjoy and we, we are blessed by that close-knit kind of connection. And it's especially true when you're this small as a denomination. Right? I mean, we love being... I know who you are, you know. I know your name, and I know your background, and I know who you're related to, and all those kinds of things. Uh, people walk in the door for the first time, don't have any of that, and so how do we welcome them? And not just welcome them into the, the fellowship, but eventually give them responsibilities to take on the leadership of the church. And if that's going to happen, you're going to have to be comfortable with a little bit of change sometimes. So we'll talk more about that as well. Well. These are the seven areas I want to start with, and in each of these areas, we're going to briefly just bring, uh, discuss a few recommendations from the committee on how we might walk in new obedience to Christ. Again, this is just a summary, so my hope is that we're going to stimulate discussion. So the first one uh, is this personal and corporate repentance. It takes considering your ways. Uh, we want to acknowledge where we have not been thinking or practicing what our Lord would call us to think and practice. And in light of the fact that over the years we've not experienced all that we would expect in terms of the blessing of God, or we haven't seen the expansion of Christ's kingdom in our denomination as much as we would expect, we can't turn around and say, God, it's your fault. You're sovereign, so <laughs> you see, you, it's your fault for that. You, you must have had that in your will, that we would be small. Well, I can technically say in some ways that's true, but often it's because we've not done all that we could. We want to commit ourselves before our God to say, Lord, change that in us. We want to commit both individually and corporately to repent and set our feet on a new path, whatever it would be. Um, again, it's hard when... I'm told by somebody else that I should repent. You ever find that really awkward? I, I, how am I, what? You want me to repent? So I can't do that. I can't impose this on you. The strategy committee can't impose this on you. But as God works in our midst by His Spirit, we want to see that happen. And, and historically, think of this. When God's people have humbled themselves in this way and sought His favor among them, it's, it's exciting to, to watch through the scripture how he blesses them. What they've reaped as a result of their repentance before him and their desire to serve him in a new way. So we anticipate that as well. That as we dedicate time and we as individuals, small groups, congregations, even the whole presbytery, if we are, are seeking God in that way and repenting of our, our ways and turning and changing as we can, that uh, on that new path, we will experience God's blessing in a new way. Now, there are sins that we can repent of that involve commission and omission, right? We talk about the two. Uh, probably there's possibilities of both. I'm going to guess that the latter of the two is probably the greater situation in our case. That sins of omission, things that we could have done that we are not doing. So that's maybe one way to think about it. The second one is this idea of prayer as a display of our trust and dependency. It's the committee's deep conviction that kingdom advancement really only occurs this way, by the power of the Holy Spirit as people pray. 
and that his ordained, ordained means for the Holy Spirit to do work in his church is through the people seeking him through prayer. Every revival that's ever taken place has always had prayer as the fundamental mover. Uh, it's, it's likely that the matter is not that we haven't been praying at all. I, I have sat in many worship services. It's nice that I'm uh, able to worship in the mornings right now to go up to McKinnon and worship with them. And one of the impressive things to me that I have thought about is that they took, take great time in their congregational prayers. They think about it a lot, and they, they're asking specific things. And I think this is really a good model for us to, to focus our attentions in on how are we seeking our God to bless us in this way. And this is what we desire in all of it. So it's not that we haven't been praying. It's that we want to have this emphasis and particular focus to say, Lord, we're responding now to a call uh, on your, from by your Spirit, we trust, that we need to see change. So regular times of re rejuvenated intercessory prayer, uh, particularly for God's favor and his presence with us and his blessing. Um, that might happen in lots of different ways, and you'll have to discuss this together. But from the pulpit on the Lord's Day, sure. In small groups, individually at your homes, throughout the week. Are you committing to meet with your brothers and sisters for prayer? Uh, specifically that we would see the Reformed Presbyterian Church of which we're a part. That we would see sinners actually come to faith. That we would see them grow and, and their lives be changed to maturity and uh, really rescued from so much of the mess in our world. And to enable that regular prayer, maybe the strategy committee's got the idea that we might have uh, someone who coordinates this for the presbytery. Because we're looking now, I hope, and the goal here is to corporately think about our, our testimony, not just as a little congregation, but what is the whole ministry of the church doing in Australia? And so if I am living in Frankston, but I hear that someone is doing a mission and work over here, we as a Frankston church are praying for their mission work. You see what I mean? We're praying for one another. We have a, a corporate a gathering of this and, and really desire to see one another uh, thrive in this. So regular times of that kind of prayer. Um, and maybe that coordinator can say, I, I've been hearing about reports from this congregation and we'll send these out. Maybe we already have a nice uh, uh, newsletter that's produced uh, which has prayer items and so on congregational bulletins, whatever it might be, but we're, we're together praying. Okay, so that's the second thing. The third one would be uh, kingdom conviction and commitment. We believe that all Christians are called to serve wholeheartedly within the church and to make that calling their chief priority. Sometimes we make this, I think it's a false idea of, well, Andy, he's a pastor, he works full time for the church. If you are not working full-time for the kingdom of Christ, then we're, we're talking in wrong language here. The Christian is a servant of the Lord. Now, they do it in all kinds of spheres and all kinds of avenues to do that. But that's their goal, is to serve Jesus Christ, to lift His name up and to see Him advanced. You take passages all through the Scripture of seeking first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 28, and on and on you go through the Scripture. So we have to take care and labor to provide those things that are necessary and the material things we need, right? Uh, but we're not, we're not so anxious about those that we're not doing the other work. Right? And that being the case, we're committed to being a, a kingdom focused and a sacrificial in our own lives in our allegation of our energies, our time, our gifts, our finances, and so on. Now I want to say that we have some some models for us here in the denomination. And I hate to even give a couple examples because there will be so many that I don't mention. But it is important to realize that some people have said to themselves, I want to do this in whatever God wants me to do. And they're willing to, to say, Lord, my life is secondary to what you want. So here it is. I will do it. Uh, I think years ago, Andrew Stewart moved to Australia because he got a call to a church. And he said, well, I'm Irish, I live in Ireland, but the Lord has given me a, a sense that I might help them there. I want to go help them. And so he took a call to come. Picked up his family, left his, his close family members and everything, and served Christ to do that. And he's been here for many years now in that role. So that's a good example. Uh, um, John Owen Louise heard a call to, 
that there was a need for a church plant in, Aus in Frankston. And they said, we're going to pick up from where we are in Geelong, in the comfort zone of where we are, and we're going to go to Frankston to serve. Now that's going to create a lot of problems for families and difficulty things here and there. Um, but because they're saying the kingdom is what's my first priority, I'll do that, and I'll trust that the Lord will provide the other things. It's a real act of faith. Uh, Brandon and Megan Fisher. Uh, there was a call, I remember being uh, there, <laughs> Uh, there was a call to young people to say, how are you serving Christ? I'm kind of giving you the same call. Uh, they heard that call when they were in their youth. They ended up marrying together and talking to each other and saying, well, how can we do that? And one of the ways they could do that was to come to Australia to serve the church here. Uh, Ryan and Laura have done the same thing. Andy and Susan have done the same thing. And you are serving in that way, many of you, in various ways. I'm simply saying that the, the, the strategy committee is saying that's really the call of the whole church. What are you thinking about? What are you saying, Lord, how can I? And I'm not saying that you means you have to get up and move necessarily or, or whatever, but am I saying that, Lord, your kingdom is first? That's what you want. So that's, the, that's that area, to consider our ways how am I allocating my funds and my work and my time and my energies? The fourth uh, area would be discipleship. And again, I'm going to talk a lot more about this on Monday, so I won't highlight it too much. But we recognize that Christ's church functions as a body. And it's made up of a variety of various gifts. In fact, God is brilliant in how he gives each one gifts and puts them in a particular body that he meets the needs there. Uh, so that the whole body might be built up. That's Ephesians 4. Okay. Um, and as iron sharpens iron, then I think one of the things that we want to do is to help one another to learn how to mature and use those gifts and, and, and come to, to the point of completion. Um, being discipled and discipling others, not only, uh, and I'll talk a lot more about this on Monday, but one of the, the ways that we typically do this is to help people understand doctrine. Uh, it's a calling of the Reformed Presbyterian Church, I think, the worldwide to be, and we tend to, you can either have a church which is uh, word-oriented or deed-oriented. We tend to be the word-oriented. It's not that we don't try to be doing deeds as well, but we, we think about the word and how central that is into the life of the congregation. And so when people come into the midst of the congregation, we try to disciple them in doctrine to understand the word correctly, and that's important. <clears throat> But if we stop there, we're in trouble in terms of discipleship because then they are not being useful in the, in the world. They're not, doc, they're not practicing that, and we need help in discipleship of practice as much as we do doctrine. So we'll talk more about that later. So uh, recommendations for new obedience might be something along the line of uh, developing in a congregation a plan to spur on the membership in these areas. Uh, not just though our responsibility of this session but it's also responsibility of one-on-one. -on -one. What each person is asking the question. Because I'm seeking first the kingdom, what efforts am I making to help another believer along to maturity? Am I doing that? Or am I just assuming that somebody else, the elders will do that? Are you personally thinking about discipling another person? And we'll talk more about that Monday. All right, uh, fifth. Developing skilled servant leaders. Uh, this is just really following the example of how it's done in the scripture. Paul, Silas, Timothy, goes on and on through, right? Priscilla, Aquila, uh, Paul's passionate service to the Colossians. You can go through it. Um, as a presbytery, we, we're asking, how can we commit to new ways to develop uh, ourselves, develop others as effective servant leaders? The characteristics that you might uh, seek to see in a, in a servant leader would be Things like a passionate communication of their faith. Uh, they draw people into God's story of redemption by sharing with them. And that frames all that they think about in life. Uh, they're thinkers. They like to help people think. They, they try to get others to be involved in that. They're teachers in learning uh, community, training, and empowering others to com contribute according to their gifts. And they demonstrate maturity in their own character. Christ-like character is what I mean. So, again, how would we do that? Well, we have to identify and involve current leaders in developing pathways to leadership for others, men and women, to equip them to be able to serve, to be initiators of 
biblically grounded ministry to other people. So uh, obviously developing leaders is going to be important. Sixth, how do we develop these re- loving relationships to share the gospel better? Uh, we believe God calls us to break down barriers with people. And that happens as we cultivate genuine relationships of love with people and trust with them, uh, including non-Christians. I think Christians sometimes shy away from that. But rather than looking at others simply as targets for evangelism, we recognize that all people are valuable and have worth because they're created in God's image. Even if they reject Christ, they have value. And that love involves vulnerability and it... it, um, Receiving as well as as giving. Compassion. We believe that God often uses those relationships as a means by which uh, His Son is proclaimed and demonstrated. And that being the case, uh, again, developing relationships of people where, and it's often what Christ did, was go into a situation with an unbeliever and, and in a sense, ask for their help. (laughs) That's weird. But He did that. He got them to serve Him And in doing so, it's a a relationship of reciprocity. Um, So we can talk more about the specifics of that. But so again, what are we asking of each of us? Well, individuals are reflecting on the relationships we have with unbelievers, especially non-Christians. Evaluating the level of trust, the level of reciprocity that currently exists, and we commit to further investment in in those relationships. Uh, yeah, let's just close off here with the last one, knowing how to engraft newcomers. We experience God's love through finding a home and belonging to the, the church. And we bring glory to God when we live and we learn and we pray and we serve and we worship together as his body. And as people come into the community of the church like that, that body actually, by God's grace, will mature. It will grow. It will adapt and have to adapt uh, with them and the unique gifts and experiences that they bring. And because of that conviction, we, we're going to commit ourselves and set ourselves to provide practical ways for people to do that, to come into the mix, to join and participate in the life of the church. Uh, how are we currently, what we might call onboarding, how are we taking people a newcomer and, and bringing them into the life of the church to ensure that those newcomers are having a sense that this is, well, I'm contributing, I'm being a part of this, uh, that they're engrafted into a full experience of church community life, both serving and being served. And again, we that takes some, it, it's, you have to be careful, but you have to be uh, doing it, which is you're entrusting responsibility sometimes as people mature and grow. So. I, I'm going to stop just because we need time to discuss. And um, again, let this let this only be something that starts to stir your thinking in your mind, and we can have further communication. I've given uh, some discussion questions to the various members of the strategy committee who are going to lead your discussion. <coughs> because we don't have enough for all of you, uh, we have a few others that are going to help out too. But please let this be something that you be, you take and you say, okay, those things that we have from the strategy committee, there was a paper that they produced. And that's accessible to each of your congregations. Uh, We'll see if there's ways we can discuss. And one of the questions on the discussion, for example, will be, did we leave anything out? Are there key areas that we didn't talk about? And which of those do you think would be the most effective? And if we made a change here, what would be the most effective? Okay. So let me just start with that. Let me pray, and then uh, you can be dismissed to those discussions.